Hello, Saint. You are now listening to the teaching sermon from the God Life Assembly Joss. May you be blessed as you listen. We ask that you teach us the trust to walk with you. The trust to stretch forth our hands and walk with you. We give you praise, O God, in the name of Jesus. Can you just give him praise in the silence of this moment? I just want you to speak with him. Many times the song conveys our hearts, but he also wants to hear your voice. Father, we bless you. We give you praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of us are glad to be in church today? Happy Mother's Day to all the fathers, to all the husbands, to all the brothers, to all the sisters. Mother's Day is not only for women. Because it's not women celebrating women. Hallelujah. So can you turn to your neighbor and say happy Mother's Day. God is the first mother. Scripture describes him as El Shaddai. The large breasted one. There is no woman who does not have food for her infant. Even if she didn't have kerosene, she didn't have fire. God put an inborn food in the woman. As long as you conceive that child, the food will not come before the child comes. The food will come when the child comes. God is an amazing wonder. Can we celebrate God? I said, can we celebrate God? He's an amazing wonder. You know, usually when I see, I see babies and, you know, we're getting fond of each other and the child is doing like, I want to follow you home. Yesterday, Zinaria carried Judah, Caleb's son, into the car. And his mom was around looking for him. So she said that she was going to go with him. So what I usually tell them is, I don't have food flax. My food flax is empty. There is no food inside. But every mother has that food flax that she didn't have to do anything to carry it. The milk comes out at the temperature that is required. She doesn't have to check if it's hot or cold. That's how deliberate God is about your needs. That's how very on time he is for every need that you have. Let's celebrate God one more time. Please, can we stand and celebrate him? Can we put our hands together for him? He has done too much. He's awesome. You cannot imagine or beat his imagination. His creation. His power. His ability. Father, we are grateful for who you are. Amen. I was going to sing a song, but then we'll just go on for now. It's Mother's Day and everybody is happy, everybody is celebrating. 
women are looking bright, beautiful, colorful, elegant. Women are the kind of folk that can just put something together without anything. They have the ability to just rally around and just produce something in no time. Hallelujah. The makeup of a woman is unique. And we have heard that the man and the woman were made in the same day. It's just that the manifestation of the woman was on a different day. But when Adam was made, he carried the woman with him. And when it's time for her, it was time for her to show forth, God pulled her out of man. And that's to say that you are special, so your day was set apart for your manifestation. And so if there's anybody here who is a woman, and when we say woman, we're not talking about only those who have birth natural children. Because every girl is going to be a woman. Every little baby girl is a woman that is waiting for that day of manifestation. It means that you're not inferior to the man. And you're not trying to grapple for space. You're not trying to contend because the man was made in his own space. And the woman was made in her own space. And it's the lack of that understanding that births movements that are not godly because we are trying to bolt out because of a lack of understanding. You are not caged. Your position is a unique place. It's a beautiful place when you understand your place. Many women are under pressure to be like somebody else. But there's a unique flavor in you. There's a unique taste that only you can produce. And many times, over and over, we have said it here. That you should not despise who you are. Because you are God's treasure. You must begin to see the way God sees. But this morning, that's not much of what I'm going to talk about. Today, what the Lord put in my heart is this. He said, my house shall be a house of prayer. That's what he said. On Friday was the International Women's Day. And it, the, the theme for 2024 was Inspire Inclusion. And there are a lot of rights that are being fought for women to be included in certain spaces of influence. But I want to let us know that God is requiring something of us today. And as much as we have dressed up and look all beautiful, I trust that we will partner with him in that which he's asking of us today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's read Matthew. Matthew 21. From verse 10. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. If you saw what happened in your imagination, it was like a commotion that was happening. And he just came into the temple. And maybe the tables were displayed with maybe currencies or something. But there were tables for the money changers. And he came and, you know, turned over the tables upside down, poured away everything that was on top of the table. And those that were standing to change money, to buy doves, 
and those who were selling. He cast them out. He pushed them out. And if you bring it to the Nigerian context or the religious context, you can say, uh uh. Why, waiting they do this man now? Can't you just talk to people? Just talk now. Can just tell us to leave that we're, what we are doing is not okay. Right? Because if somebody comes and does that, you would even say, and he calls himself a believer. See how he's behaving. See how he's acting. But Jesus did not act based on observation. His motion was from within him. His inspiration was from inside. And he threw the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. So you can imagine, maybe doves were flying all over, you know, because of the whole commotion. Maybe some people saw that and some people were trying to wonder what's happening, you know. And he said in verse 13, he said, and, he, and said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. This scripture has a root in Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah 50. Verse. Let's start from. From verse four. Isaiah fifty six, not fifteen, fifty six, verse four, and I read. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the strangers that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants. That's verse 6 now. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting, from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. For mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. If you read some other um, versions, maybe in um, Mark and Luke, it says, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. There is a place of prayer for mothers. And when um, Godwin came and gave the poem, that was the first thing he started highlighting. And when Pastor Purity came up, she began to talk about prayer and about seeking his face and focusing and setting gaze on him. A lot of women have been carried about. Yes, there's so much that a woman does. And from that poem that our sister Doris Garuba gave, she said they have only two hands. And this is not to undermine what men do. Because, of course, we are not in competition. It has been set clear that everyone is in their place of capacity and definition of assignment. For everything that God has called you to do, there is a definition and there is a capacity. But as a woman, as a mother, 
there's a place of prayer. The prayer of a mother. And when you look through scripture, you see a lot of women with examples. Because prayer is not just an action. Prayer is a lifestyle. Prayer is not supposed to be something that is an activity that you do and seize from. I put it in the simplest way when teaching my boys that prayer is like gisting with God. Prayer is just talking to God about everything. And pastor has retreated it that the best way or the highest pathway to meditation is that you turn every thought into a conversation with God. So when I say prayer, there's a stereotype that we have in our mind about prayer that wearies us already before we have started. Many times when you talk about prayer, People feel a weight of downcastness. True or false? There's a lie that is striving somehow in your heart that, do you know, you don't have, you don't, you don't, it, it will be boring. What will we be saying for f- five hours, six hours? They have announced that there's prayer stretch next Saturday. What will we be praying? How will I stay for hours and just be? Somebody shared something with me recently that blessed me so much and stirred up that spirit of prayer in me again. He said he used to be a drunkard. He used to drink so much. He's now a pastor. He's in leadership in his church. He used to drink so much that he would be drunk, driving, have an accident, leave the car there and enter into the next club. Meaning the energy of his drinking was higher than the threat of dying or death. Because when he said it, I was like, what? So you are not afraid of dying. You are not afraid of any harm that will happen to you. You just, that vibe inside you was too high for you to consider. He will leave his car there and enter into another joint. When he received Christ... And he started praying. He said for him, prayer is like drinking. So, God took advantage of his darkness and his dark days. And built, you know, he built that capacity in him. And when he crossed over to this side, he can pray for hours. And he's running late for work and he's checking time, but the you know it's like he just started like you know it's just ringing in the inside of him so what am I trying to say there's a reality to prayer that you have not experienced that makes you feel like it is burdensome to pray and today God is saying you occupy a very pivotal place Just as being a woman. Not to talk of the assignment that he has put in your hand. Did you hear that testimony? That she just swept and prayed in Jesus name. You don't need kabashakakaka for some things in that sense. Don't miss, don't, don't, um. I can't hear. Don't um, misinterpret or misquote. Don't don't understand what I'm trying to say. English. Right? A prayer of faith. That's all that is required. Faith. And I always refer to that scripture in Mark. Mark 11, I think it's verse 24 that says that whatsoever you ask for when you pray, once you have believed that you have it, you will have whatsoever you have asked for. 
believe that you have received them, then you shall have them. That means the distance between prayer and the answer of prayer is what? Believing that you have it. I didn't come to break the exegesis of prayer. I just came to emphasize what God is saying to us as women. That his house, that was what his house was destined for. Yes, there's warmth, there's warmth in his house. When you come and you fellowship with each other, you hug, you peck, you just gist and chat after service. There is warmth, that smile on that woman's face, that high five, that selfie, and everything that, you know, just makes you feel like you belong. is beautiful. But there is something that the house of God is meant to be for. He says, my house must be a house of prayer. If I may ask, how much do you pray? And when I say this, don't misunderstand me and think I'm saying like other people would say, if you have not prayed for a certain number of hours, you are not spiritual. Because prayer is not, is not activity, it's the outcome. That's what justifies prayer. Hallelujah. We see in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 2, let's go there quickly. During the dedication of Jesus we see a woman there. Verse 36. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Fenuel of the tribe of Asher, she was, a, she was of great age and lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four score and four years. How much is four score? Eighty. So for eighty-four years she was a widow. Which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayer night and day. That focus that Pastor Purity told us about during the prayer session, that gaze is prayer. I said prayer is not an activity, it's not an action that you do and seize and live. It's a lifestyle. One of the major definitions of prayer is communication. And when I checked the, the, the root meaning of the word prayer, in that scripture in Matthew 21 that it says my house shall be a house of prayer one of the definitions of that word prayer is judgment that means when you enter into prayer what you are doing is you are enforcing the will of God in the realm of the spirit you are realigning every injustice that is pervading in your time around you in your office, in your place of work in the marketplace. And that's why women must rise to the highest echelons of the places that you are. Because there's an influence of heaven that needs to be done on that place. And while I was coming, I was meditating as I drove and, and came to church. I think God was trying to say this to me. That every opportunity you have is an opportunity to introduce God. That if they give you a five minutes charge, you can't jitter and waste the time. You are like an SSS. So when you come around, you don't look like you're about to wreak havoc. You use the encasing of the title of the position that you have in that place of influence and authority as the door, as the key. And you unleash the kingdom of God. You unleash the thought of God. You unleash the frequency of the wisdom of the kingdom of God. As a woman. You don't have any limitation. Your limitation is with you. The day you decide you cross the line. I tell you the truth. 
because Satan knows how deadly you are. He will spend time. I was in meditation and I just saw, you know, a passage. And I didn't even know I was going to share this here. I saw a narrow passage and I saw a lot of women trapped in that place. Trapped, trying to just make an exit into the other side. Trapped with, oh, I am not enough. Oh, I don't feel qualified. Oh, I am a nobody. You know, many women are trapped there for years. I was in that passage for a very long time. Where I felt like I didn't have anything to offer. Where I felt I didn't know enough to be able to share, to give. And just recently, I just laid down on my bed and I was just in meditation and I saw that passage. And some women don't ever leave that passage before they leave earth. So they never manifest the sweetness, the savour, the uniqueness that God put in the inside of them. And Satan fortifies that passage as much as he can because he knows once you step out, he's done for. Once you step out of that place, you're going to wreak havoc in the kingdom of darkness. You will pull women out because you know what it feels like to have been trapped for this long. And so I said, between your manifestation is just a line that the day you decide, I cross this line, then you leave that place and you are free. And then you become an agent of change, causing change, because what you become, that you can give. Hallelujah. So I don't want us to spend time talking about, oh, God loves you. Oh, God has destined you to be something. No, we have heard this message for too long. But I know that God keeps reminding us because of that fortification that Satan has trapped us in. That there are some women that need to hear it over and over and over so they can break out of that place. And build a formidable force with the kingdom of God that breaks every darkness that is in front of them. That virtuous woman in the book of Proverbs, there's a, there's a part that caught my mind, which was, I think, the last few verses that talks about the woman who fears the Lord because you cannot achieve all that without a relationship with God. I tell you the truth. Many times you wish, you will, you plan, but you cannot achieve it. You don't have the capacity to do it by just wishing and willing. You must arrive at the place where you let him take you to fulfill it, to accomplish it. Because no, no human being can just do that now. All that. How do you want to do it? But a woman who knows the Lord and the Lord knows her is that kind of woman that can enter into that place and be excellent at everything. Nothing will suffer in your hand. Your children won't suffer. Your business, your husband, your calling, your career. Everything maximized to its fullest. Many women use marriage and children as a reason not to serve the Lord. Before you married, who was your Lord? Some of us, our children are our Lord. They dictate if we will come to church or not. Why is that so? Your love for God must be stronger than any distraction. Enough for you to prioritize and get the wisdom from God to arrange everything together. She dishes instructions to her maids. She caters for her husband. She caters for the children. She caters for business. Everything is, is taken care of. Because she knows who she bows to. She knows who she talks to. And so Anna, 
Scripture said that she stayed praying. She, she was just married for seven years. So for, for how many years was she in the temple? Praying night and day. Some, some people feel like prayer is punishment. There are many lies about prayer. Once you have a grasp and a hold on the truth of prayer, you will just blaze and seal. You will just move. So they said prayer. In church, we have prayers as a church. We have prayers every Saturday from 7 a.m. How many of you have attended that 7 a.m. prayers this year? We have had January, February, we're in March. So let's say four Saturdays, okay, apart from election and sanitation. Even on sanitation days, we pray online. And that's just a part of prayer. Don't get me wrong and think that I'm saying that that's just all about prayer. I said prayer is a lifestyle. So I shared one post some years ago and I said, why is it that on Sundays we don't spend time with God in devotion and worship before we go to church? Because we feel it's Sunday now, we are going to God's presence. And this was how I ended that post. I said, prayer is not an, um, um, fellowshipping with God is not an obligation. It's a lifestyle. So it's something that you can't, it's a natural thing that you just do. You don't have to start planning it to be with him. You don't have to start calculating it and writing a timetable to be with God. You just find yourself with him. Many times when I'm alone, it's the sweetest times for me. Because I just get that time of just me and you. That I can just tell him one thing that I love about him. And I can just thank him for being with me. And I can just talk with him, communicate with him. So there is this seeming trap that is in that scripture in Matthew 7. That says, ask, seek, knock. Then he says, you have not received because you have not asked. You have not sought and you have not knocked. And somebody will say, uh-uh. If he knows what I need, why, wouldn't, why shouldn't he just give it to me? Because he's a loving father now. He's a faithful God. Why wouldn't he just give what I need? Because he also knows what I need. Because scripture says, before you even open your mouth, he knows. So what is the trap in you asking? The trap is that he wants to hear your voice. The trap is that he wants to have a conversation, an occasion to talk with you. Because he wants a fellowship. He wants, to, he wants you to know him. He wants to tell you something. Because it's not just about you telling him. He wants you to listen out. It was miles of blessed memory that said about prayer. That you are too noisy to hear him. Because when you enter the car, music is playing. I know there are people who can hear him in the midst of the noise because they have formed the culture of hearing him. So he can obstruct anything to speak to you and you will hear. But I, you are learning to hear him. You know, and so in the car, there is music. And then you come out, friends, Ah, you are just talking, you are just gisting. So there is no space for you to hear his voice because there's too much noise about, about you and around you. Hallelujah. My house shall be a house of prayer. Can we fulfill that hard desire in God that came out through Jesus? That we will not misuse his house for any other reasons 
that we will fulfill the part of his house being a place of prayer. That's why you can come in even during weekdays and just come into this auditorium and pray. That's why early in the morning on Thursdays you can just slide in and just be with him in the midst of other people for incense. Amen. It's time to take it deeper. You are not at the best place in your relationship with God. And this message is not only for women. It's for every one of us. But God has used the occasion of mothers to speak to us. Because he doesn't waste any opportunity that he has to warn us, to reassure us, to encourage us, to push us. You must begin to ask him questions. Many of us have relationships with God that are so religious, you can't even ask him a question. You are too afraid of him. But our call to knowing him is not terror. It's not, it's not tyranny. It's reverence. And reverence is not collected. You give reverence. Do you understand? You give, you give reverence. Hallelujah. And I'm still reading about Anna. Verse 38. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee and to their own city, Nazareth. Amen. God is calling us. You don't have to be a widow. The reason why I read this scripture is that there is no category that exonerates you from being a woman of prayer. There is no category whether old or young, whether married or single. In fact, the earlier the better because you build a foundation. I was, re I was sharing about Rahab somewhere and I said that Rahab met the Lord as a prostitute. She met the Lord in the place of prayer in the place of meditation. She was pondering about the goodness and the greatness of God. And scripture said that when those spies came, she told them, I know that God has, the Lord has given you this land. She was prophesying the destruction of her own land. Scripture says that the fear of them had melted the hearts of those in Jericho already. There was fear resident in their hearts. But they had a fortification that they trusted in. But Rahab said, I know that the Lord has given you this land. And the day you people come for this, the destruction of this land, remember me. She called him the Lord four times. In Joshua 2, verse 19, 20, 21, 23, she said, the Lord. Who can call him the Lord who has not met him? Rahab met him. I'm convinced she met him in her meditations. She said, because the Lord, your God is God in heaven and on the earth. That was Rehab's testimony about God. What does she know about him apart from what he did? She would have just hidden herself and been afraid of what was coming. But she called him the Lord. When Aaron and Moses went to the king of Egypt, 
the Pharaoh and said, the Lord said, release us, let's go and worship him. What did Pharaoh say? Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let you people go? But Rahab said, I know the Lord. You must enter into the place where you know the Lord and the Lord knows you. As a prostitute, she negotiated her family out of that destruction. And she settled in Israel. Married from the tribe of Judah. And entered into the genealogy of Jesus. Why? He's not willing that any should perish. So he took advantage of her heart at the time she was pondering. And he revealed himself to her. So she knew the capacity of God. She knew he would override this fortification as thick as this wall is, as secured as we feel because of this wall. I know the testimony of the Lord. Deborah was just one woman. If you read about Deborah, there are so many things about Deborah. But she was one woman. She prophesied. And Barak had the prophecy, but he said, I'm not going if you're not going with me. So she didn't only pray. She also went. Manoah's wife, the mother of Samson, she received instructions by faith. She kept it. Do you know what it means to receive certain kinds of instructions of consecration? He says, this one is going to be set apart, a Nazarite. Let no razor touch his head, no strong drink. And you too, the mother, no strong drink. And I was sharing, I said, do you know what it means to enter into a party? And they are trying to do a toast, but you can't take wine because there's a consecration upon you. And this woman was able to steward, steward, what God was doing in the place of prayer. She had a relationship with God. Do you know how I know? After the angel came the second time and she called her husband, when he finished everything and they went back and he realized he has disappeared or after this sacrifice, he has gone. Ah, that means it was God that we encountered. Oh, I didn't know. And Manoah was afraid. He said that we are going to die because we have seen God. We are certainly dead. And she said, how can we die? All the plan is in his hand. He's the one who revealed it. If he wanted to kill us, will he come and give us a message? She had a relationship with God. So she knew what it meant to, if you see God, you will die. And what it meant to just have an encounter and be a steward, a servant of God that will steward the, his doings and nurture it. And cover it until it comes to burn like a big flame. Many things have been written about different women here in the Bible. What will be written concerning you? I'm not concerned that it has to be a big thing. But that which was written concerning you before you came. Because there's a predestination. And there is... A preordination. You were ordained for something. So at the end, we want to read that it was written concerning her that she will steward women. She will protect their marriages. She will teach them how to be wives. We want to hear that it was written concerning you that at the point of delivery for every child, she was able to speak destiny into them. She was able to realign every child and speak, superimpose the power of God at delivery. We want to hear that it was written that you were one of those who was able to produce one equipment that came and rescued the people who were dying in hospitals because the, that thing was deficient. We want to hear about you. 
that there was a wisdom that you provided. Because there's something that was written about you. Read Romans. There's a foreordination. It says, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you and I ordained you. I set you apart to be something. But you can never attain that thing that you were made for if you don't have that relationship with him in the place of prayer. For me, prayer is many things. Honestly. I've not I've been able to unbox myself out of that stereotype of definition of prayer. Prayer is fellowship. Prayer is meditation. Prayer is communication. Prayer is listening. So much that prayer is. And on the occasion of Mother's Day or the Modern Sunday, I want to invite you into a new level of relationship with God. I want you to be introduced into a deeper level of prayer and an accuracy of the definition of what prayer is. To enter into the ease of prayer because there's nothing God made that he wanted us to find it very difficult to maneuver, to reach him. He reached out to us first while we knew nothing. Why will it make it difficult for us to get to him? Is a lie. It is a lie. And today we trump that lie and enter into the ease of prayer. To enter into the sweetness of fellowshipping with God and loving it above every other thing. Where will the psalmist say, I cherish you more than my necessary food? That means you nurture that desire so much that it becomes the highest striving thing in your life. That your attention and your focus is wrapped on the Lord. That there's no motion that happens within you without his permission. Because many times as women, we feel uh, we should be loved, we should be pampered, we, should be, we are supposed to be treated as, the, as a weaker vessel. So your emotions are flapping and hitting every wall. But there's a spirit-led emotion. There's a spirit-censored emotion. That when things are thrown at you, you are fearless. Your emotion is not dancing all over the place. It is passing through that channel of his searching eyes to permit you to feel or not to feel because many times we just we are just humans no we are not just humans we are a different species we are a divine nation a divine nation Many times we react to unnecessary things. Our emotions are too delicate. That's what happened. You know, the delicateness of the emotion of a woman was supposed to be a strong tool in the hand of God. That is easy for God to say, go and you go. And that was what happened to Eve. Satan took advantage of that delicate nature of her emotion. And she was able to just, in a very short time, in a matter of seconds, just change her mind. But there's that place you arrive at with God where if a suggestion is thrown at you, you will ask him, is that so? Your judgment will be from him before your action. Because many times for emotions, you just find yourself feeling a certain way. And that scripture that pastor shared, it says that hold back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then will I be upright. And I'll be innocent of the great transgression. And that great transgression is what? Presumption. That's what emotions do. They presume. You presume that this guy likes me. Then you start dancing in that tune. You presume she doesn't like me. So you start getting angry and offended. As a woman, your emotion is a powerful tool. And today, you must surrender it to God. You must give it to him.
Jochebed was able to steward a giant. And from the fate of Jochebed, Moses drank of that fate. And by fate, he left Egypt. If you read Hebrews 11, scripture mentioned how by faith he left Egypt. By faith, he went into Egypt. By faith, he came out of Egypt with the children of God. So whatever faith you display now is going to trickle down into your seed. So it's time to arise in faith. Zipporah was the daughter of a Midianite. How did she know when to intervene when the angel of God was coming for Moses? She had an encounter. There are people who their stories were not told, and she met the Lord and she said, I receive you into my heart. But when you look at the storyline, you can tell this one met the Lord somewhere. Her father was a priest. There's that which is written concerning you. Enough of the pity party. Enough of sitting in the ashes of your past. Enough of wallowing in thinking about how much you have wasted time and now you are wasting time on thinking about how much you have wasted time. It's time to arise as mothers. True mothers as it is what in the kingdom of God. We are not just betting natural children. We are sharpening arrows that will hit the target. We are custodians. We are so many things. You must maximize this opportunity and privilege of who God has made you to be. It's not enough to be an ordinary woman. Nothing, anybody can be that. Anybody can be that. He's calling us into a place of prayer, of a depth in relationship with him, where you will know the Lord and he will know you. Just talk to him. Everything that has been a weakness that Satan has used to bring women down or use women to bring people and men down and things down is a strength is a strength that has been abused abused by ignorance and lack of knowledge abused by the orientation of darkness your shape and your beauty is not all that there is about you as a woman the future of being able to feed a child is not all that it is about you. You are a weapon in the hand of your father. How can you be wasted? Tell him, God, maximize me. Maximize me. Today, I step out of that corridor that has trapped me In comparing myself with others, in trying to be like this person, today you do this hairstyle to look like this person, tomorrow you see another person, you change hairstyle to look like that person. No, do what you want to do. If you like it, like it. Just like what you like and do it. You are unique. Your flavor is uncommon. Your flavor cannot be compared to any other flavor and the first partaker of that flavor is God himself because he created us for his pleasure he's, he created us for his pleasure he created you for his pleasure will you deny him the pleasure that he created you for because you are wasting time The thief has been caught. Henceforth, Hitato, we step out in the fullness of what he has made us to be. We lose every chain that is dragging us behind and telling us that we cannot do it. We step out, we bolt out by the Spirit of God.
while we sang Tolu led us to worship and she said you are the highest and that scripture in Luke just came back to me again when Mary asks how shall these things be he says the power of the highest so his name is the highest that's one of his names the highest shall overshadow you and that power is right here now to break you out of that box that has defined you against in contrary to the definition of your preordination break out of that box today by the occasion of the women's day because God uses every occasion God maximizes every occasion we declare saviors arising among our women saviors 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 arising women who take their place and own their place they own their place they maximize every opportunity they let the kingdom of God come they let you must permit you must let father maximize us maximize the purpose for which you made us we refuse every name that Satan has caged us in we break out we step out of that corridor that trap that trapping area we step out we step out out of that voice that says you are not beautiful step out he says that and everything he made was very good very good we break out of every lie of satan we set loose and we run and we fly in the name of Jesus. Father, we bless you. Can you dedicate yourself to God? Whether you are a man, woman, child, teenager, tell, tell God, I dedicate myself to you. I dedicate, I rededicate myself to you. I rededicate myself to the purpose for which was written concerning me before I arrived. I, if, I, if I am outside of the course, realign me as I rededicate myself. Put me back on track. Let the pleasure and savour that comes out of me, let it rise to only you. Father, we give you praise. In the name of Jesus. We have come to the end of today's sermon. You can listen to more sermons from www.pastorchintok.com or listen to our teaching podcast from Google, Apple and Spotify podcast services using the channel The GLA Podcast. You can also follow live services on www.mixlr.com slash The GLAJ.